Hi folks, uh, welcome back to the channel. I wanted to start off uh, with sort of an introduction to the types of things that I've been working with for the past handful of years that's, uh, that's based on, gosh, my experience teaching science and technology and engineering and mathematics for the past uh, 20, 25 years. It's an introduction that I enjoy um, giving to or introducing to uh, our new students on the uh, on what STEM is, a definition. Uh, but I also find it valuable talking with uh, our seasoned students who are about to graduate and, and move on to their careers, and maybe even my, my seasoned colleagues who may not have considered it this way, of how the science, technology, engineering, mathematics is, are, are, are how they are integrated and how we can view them as a whole. So I created a presentation um, that I, I, I have in my, my bucket of things to, to, to share, and I thought I'd, I thought I'd share it here and see if perhaps um, uh, you would enjoy it and find it useful as well. So I have a few buttons here to control um, how this presentation goes. Um, there's the presentation. I'm going to go press another button and switch it so that I become small and it becomes uh, the star. Um, this is a this is an image that uh, I found from the web. Um, it's attributed to several uh, websites. Um, again, it's uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Um, this particular image uh, has most recently been attributed with the United States Department of Agriculture, and uh, this this collection of um, of this prezi, this collection of slides, um, was uh, was was used uh, to introduce students. Um, uh, under a grant uh, from the USDA, it's a very long mouthful, uh, USDA, N-I-F-A, A-F-R-I, E-W-D, F-A-N-E. Oh my gosh, these are all organizations underneath the United States Department of Agriculture. And um, just for those of you who want to check it out, <laughs> this, is the, um, this is the grant that we have received as a collection of um, uh, instructors and scientists here at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. Um, I'm a co-principal investigator on this. Um, so yeah, I, I I need a cheat sheet as well. So let me see if my, my buttons work here. So USDA, I, I, that I that I do remember is United States Department of Agriculture. Uh, kind of important. We are we are um, in the school of where I am in this teaching in the school of agricultural and natural sciences. So agricultural is a big uh, a big source of um, of importance for us. Um, NIFA or N I F A uh, is the National Institute of Food and our Agriculture, uh, and all these all these individual um, uh, offices offices underneath the USDA have um, have their own uh, own website. Um, A F R I is the uh, is a program called the Agriculture and Food Research Initiative. Uh, in addition to education, we also do uh, do research into how to well as, as you would expect how to better grow our food how to how to um how to um grow our food and also uh, harvest our food or harvest of uh, our fish um more sustainably um that's under afri um ewd we finally have um uh, an education phrase inside their education and workforce development initiative and this fane is food agriculture non-formal education so this is what our grant is for and it is for making workshops and and sort of sort of summer um, summer groups uh, for for high school students and 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 young um, sort of starting freshmen and sophomore undergraduates um, to introduce them to this topic. So this is where all this came from. Big old mouthful, but there we go. Get it out of the way. So there, there's a lot to unfold, and I'm I'm as I explained in my introduction video about me. I I, I feel like I'm very excited to explain. I have a lot to say. I'm a professor, so I profess things often. Um, however, we we need to compartmentalize it. When I speak with incoming freshmen, uh, I'm talking with him, uh, when I speak with incoming freshmen, or I speak with outgoing seniors, or graduate students, or colleagues who also have several years, um, it all depends on how much um, information uh, we're bringing to the conversation as to where do I start or where do we start in our conversation. Um, very similar to the way things work um, inside Hollywood and movies. We could drop some names. They'd all be dissimilar. Um, we usually come out with a with a, with a, um, a movie or a book. It's very, very popular. And then we go back and say, hey, you know what? One way before we move forward is to go backwards and explain what came before. So of course the word prequel 
is all over our um our vocabulary and say oh this this presentation is a prequel almost everything well not almost sorry everything <laughs> that, that i'm going to share with you in a few moments um has a prequel story and each of these stories deserves its own series it deserves its own a trilogy it deserves its own series of books uh, in fact they do have entire series of books we have entire majors of study in uh, in college that are attributed to each of these concepts so uh, what i'm trying to do is i'm going to try to focus it down into our conversation and then um over the course of the following discussions um, after this one, my goal is to sort of do a little prequel work and show you where um, how all these things fit in. So one of the things that I am most animated about is introducing and um, showing folks how to work with systems and how to understand them. Uh, I speak English. I may not speak it very well. Um, a lot of these terms, um, everyone in the audience has heard. Um, our students have heard them. Um, so I'm not trying to... Um, convince anyone that they're uneducated or they don't have the correct vocabulary. Of course, they have the correct vocabulary. It's simply discussing and sort of looking at our, our words in a different perspective and see how they fit together. So system, this is the, the word of the day. It's the word of my career, quite honestly. Um, so there's a lot of things that go into that particular word. And one of the things that we talk about, who's we? I like to use a lot, we a lot. We systems thinkers, we scientists uh, like to think about is that there are so many different systems um, that we continue to um, discover and even invent um, every day. There's more and more systems to talk about. We have to learn to, or we have one of the techniques of being a systems th thinker is the ability to compartmentalize. We've heard that word before as well. And the way that we compartmentalize what we're talking about in this current conversation, maybe we can expand it later on, but what we're talking about now belongs in a nice, tidy box. Um, so here's my blue box. I just grabbed my drawing tools, uh, made a box. So the idea is the thing that we are talking about um, fits inside this box. And I just heard myself say that phrase, inside the box. Um, this is where the phrase thinking outside the box or outside of the box comes from. Um, there's reasons why. Um, if all you do is put the importance of this particular system inside this little tiny box and you put it into a, a lead container and you lock it and throw away the key, um, that's not very useful when, um, when things change and we need to come up with new solutions if all we're doing is using what's already living inside the box. So here's my little pointer, if I can get it to work. Uh, there's, if all we're doing is we're, we're th only using tools and, and, and discussing things that are inside the box, um, that's not gonna help us. So we have to realize that this box has some goes ins and it has some goes outs. So arrow wise, there's my goes in, um, and literally mean things that we put into the box, the goes in. Uh, things that go in. Um, but of course, as a scientist, uh, we uh, we don't use goes in. I like to use goes in. Uh, but in instead, we typically use the phrase for those things that we put into the box. Um, yeah, I wish we had a better marketing team. We call it input. Things that we put in are input. Fantastic. Also mentioned in the box uh, is porous. So usually when we think of something have a hole in it or a pore or a gate or a window, things can flow in and importantly, things can flow out. So we also have things that flow out. We have things that we put on the outside and of course that's called output. So uh, removing this goofy word salad of inputs and outputs, it's almost very, very quickly turns into a scientific or a computer science discussion uh, of what's going on, but the input and output. Inside the box, again, thinking inside the box, if we look at this system as something that is in motion, something that takes input and then does something with it and then produces the desired output, we do have to think inside the box. Thinking inside the box is not a bad thing. It's just that when you only think inside the box, you need to learn to think outside the box. You have to do both. Um, inside the box, we have something called a process. So the process is turning the inputs into outputs. 
And again, each of these individual topics have prequels that are are larger, larger, larger. They're encyclopedias uh, long, and people spend their entire careers studying these individual topics. But today, we're just making sure we understand them. Um, so here's our system. Our system is this box. The box allows us to put what we're talking about in the box to sort of narrow things down. My brain's only so large. People, other people have much larger brains, um, but eventually um, they have to sort of stop uh, depending on what they're talking about. Maybe some astrologer somewhere or an astronomer somewhere is talking about cosmology and thinking about the entire university. That's a pretty, uh, the entire universe is a big box. Um, but we have the box. We have the process inside the box. We have the inputs that go into it. We have the outputs that go out to it. And this comprises the system, but we have one more term that is also equally important. So system itself, we have the box, uh, input, process, output, that's one, two, and three, that's fantastic. We have a fourth, we have a fourth topic that is extremely important to systems thinkers and it affects how we talk about um, STEM and the like. So that is the environment. Um, it's the environment of the system. If we're thinking inside the box, we're talking about the process. If we're thinking outside the box, we're thinking about the environment. Um, this is not necessarily environmental science, like our own personal environments. Like right now I'm in my, my little den here where I have my camera set up. Um, if I open the door behind me, um, that's an output. I leave, I go into my home. That's the environment that my den is in. I go through a couple other doors and get to the front door and then I'm outside. And that, of course, that is the true environment for my house. And depending on how much it is raining, or depending on how cold it is, or depending on how warm it is, or depending on how much thunder or snow, those can be inputs that affect um, how we do things inside of our house. So the changing environment is important for us to consider because it may affect where, how expensive, how easily, or if at all, we get the inputs that we need to process to turn into the desired output. So we always need to keep environment in mind. Again, a shout out to the environmental scientists. Um, that has a little bit of a different connotation, but when it comes to system, um, the folks who are studying the environment, um, are, are that's where they're at. They're, they're looking at how the surrounding, um, the surrounding, well, environment, the surrounding area, the surrounding um, situation, affects things that go inside and again that system can be us it can be our crops it can be the fish i talked about earlier um all over the place so here is an example from nature of a system this happens to be a cell wall um what's the giveaway this is called extra cellular space this is even though it looks to be white i'm guessing this is the blood um, that is outside the cell. Um, this is sort of a bluish gray. This is intracellular space. This is inside the cell where we have the different cell parts. Um, and this is the lipid bilayer. Um, again, another four years of, of college goes into studying how this works. A lipid is a fat. Um, that's why we eat fats. That's why I have plenty of it. In all of our cells, in order to keep the outside away from the inside, um, the outside is water-based, the inside is water-based, and the lipid, the fat, bilayer, one of these guys, one of these guys, the bilayer means two, like bicycle, outside and inside, one facing the out, one facing the in, is it's a wall. It's meant to keep the inside in and the outside out. Um, that's how that works. Um, this is very similar. Um, depending on how gross jaw out you are about cells to bring food into it. But this is how Italian dressing works. The Italian dressing, the, the oil level, the vegetable oil um, resides on top of the sal salad dressing. And then the water, um, which contains vinegar, is on the bottom. The reason why we like Italian dressing is that there are certain flavors and spices that are water-soluble, and they live in the, the vinegar layer. And there are other spices and flavors that are only oil soluble or fat soluble and they live in the top layer um so they separate we can see visually that the oil is on top and the vinegar is on the bottom and of course we shake it up and then we go ahead and put it on the salad we put it back in the fridge and then it separates again this is how nature does that um, nature has either realized or it would it evolved the fact that um 
that uh, the way we do this is we keep the outside out, the inside in by making this, if you will, float or sink to the bottom, the water based, and then the things that are outside of this sphere uh, have floated or are outside. However, having a cell with a cell wall, a box that does not permit for things to come in or to go out, um, the cell quickly dies. The, the, the process stops. The process needs supplies. It needs ingredients. And then it produces an output. So taking a look at this, there are particular little other cellular structures inside of our wall, um, which are specifically called channels. And inside that channel, just like a channel that a boat sails through, um, this channel over here where my mouse is, is moving around, um, it looks as if this is uh, for sodium ions. Uh, we take so salt, and again, you have to watch your sodium, but we need sodium to survive. That's why we, we crave and we use salt. And this is a sodium channel that actually allows the sodium molecules or sodium ions, or not molecules, to come inside. On the other side, we happen to have um, K diffusion or potassium um, diffusion. We get potassium um, from various salts as well in our food. That goes back out. And then the middle, um, whereas these two channels happen to be just open areas, holes, if you will, portholes where these things selectively pull back in, in the middle, it happens to be a pump, just like your heart, just like your swimming pool. Um, this is where the cell turns on this pump and can selectively um, send sodium out after it's been diffused in or pull potassium in after it's diffused out. It can take action and say, hey, just uh, just floating around here, uh, the way this is working, I don't have enough um, I don't have enough potassium and I'm losing it over here. So we can go ahead and we can pull some extra in um, on purpose. Again, cellular biology, an entire major, an entire career. Uh, I love falling down rabbit holes and uh, and going too far in explanations, but that's that's where we're at. So let's let's move on. Here's an example of a real system. So here's our system. Again, there's the box in order to allow us to think about what we're thinking. The environment is on the outside. There's our process. Um, just saying that there's input is very important. Just saying there's output is very important. But um, it turns out that we, who's we, scientists and um, and and systems specialists, um, because there are so many things that can be input and there's so many things that could be output, we like to classify them into three primary things. Three is a, a a huge number in science. Uh, three is a huge number in comedy. Three bucks, three ducks walk into a bar is much funnier than, than a duck walks into a bar. There's usually happens in threes. Um, input wise, we can consolidate all these different inputs into energy, material, or information. And maybe a combination of all three of them, but that primarily those are our values. So we input energy, material, and information. And each of these guys happen to have a prequel trilogy that can be used to describe what's going on. On the output, um, there's no, nothing special about the output other than it's going out, um, is that we also have energy, material, and information on the outside as well. So my introduction to STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, is how do these four concepts how do these four disciplines, how do these four things fit into our system? So we can't go anywhere without a box. So we're talking about the STEM system, if you will, or STEM as a system. And this time around, um, gosh, let, let's include the environment because we always do. In fact, um, even though I introduced the environment word last of the four, um, it may be the most important. Um, the STEM that we're going to study or the stem that we hope to work in really does depend on where we're working um and we'll see an example at the conclusion of this talk are we working in a lab are we working in a field somewhere are we working underwater are we working on the international space station are we working inside the human body where are we working that's going to completely set up what type of inputs and what type of outputs um, we're going to be able to use depending on the environment we're in. So that's very, very important. But let's look at the process generically. So there's STEM. And so far I've, I've drawn the box. And so far I've said environment, where's the S and the T and the E and the M? They have to go somewhere. 
Um, so I like to place mathematics inside the process. There's an entire prequel uh, discussion about what mathematics is, but we'll get into that um, eventually. Um, but that's where mathematics is going to help us do what we need to do. It's going to help us to figure out what we're going to build, if you will, the STEM as a process. It's going to help us perform the STEM process. So we need mathematics. If we already know mathematics, hooray. Um, if you've already been through all of your mathematics in high school, wonderful. If you're an entering college student and you, you wonder why do I need to take more math, um, again, the more we, the, the, the greater the skill we have in mathematics, it's going to help us to do our STEM work, if you will. Underneath mathematics is where the E goes. Again, when I say under, it's just in the box. So mathematics and engineering, remember process is the doing. Um, I'm not why I'm drawing a, a, a sort of a, a, a spinning cog or a spinning gear in here, but this is where we actually turn the machine on and things happen. Um, I like the word engineering because engineering has the I-N-G word uh, uh, suffix, meaning we do stuff. So mathematics and engineering, that's in the, that, that allows us to process what we need as input and turn it into output in the STEM, the STEM, um, well, the STEM system. So gosh, process of elimination, everyone knows what this is. What's the input? What do we need and how do we use, if we're using mathematics and engineering to, I'll go ahead and drop the term, build something or make something or invent something or produce an invention or innovation, what input do we use? And of course, the input that we use is science. Now, again, prequel wise, Science has a long, long history, and we'll get into that as well, but science gives us the parts. Science gives us some of the tools that are necessary to do the um, thing inside the process. So here's our science, that's input. And then this STEM process as a system, what does STEM, STEM get us? Everyone should study STEM, or at least we need more STEM majors, or STEM is important. Um, let's fund more STEM. The reason we're funding more STEM is we, it's, at, at the time of this, um, this recording, it's 2024, um, we happen to live in a very highly technological society. Um, hopefully we keep on going. Hopefully we get more technological. Hopefully not everything breaks and we go back to hunter, hunting and gathering on the land without many tools running around. Um, but again, technology has its own place as a prequel. Technology, in my mind, starts with the T because it does. Um, it, technology is a, is a tool. So this is the tool making process. So if we, if it were 300, 400 years uh, ago, um, before we had lots of electricity running around or lots of our, our current computing systems, uh, obviously, um, STEM might be, hey, this is a, this is a presentation that someone's giving about how to make new tools for blacksmiths or for window makers or barrel makers or shoe makers. We have all of these phrases that we use. Um, we, continually make new tools and these new tools cycle back and allow science to discover more parts those parts are then integrated and and put together and used to invent and innovate new things those new things become a new technology and this process this um this system becomes a a feedback or a system with feedback where the technology that we make the tools that we make are used to do better or additional science, and that keeps the entire system going. Um, as far as science itself, the actual doing of the science, there's a scientific method, there's a scientific process. The reason why STEM folks like myself keep the, the STEM separate from the technology and the engineering and mathematics is because of this view. Um, experts who are scientists they concentrate on learning new things and getting new parts technologists who are experts in technology are the um are in charge of and depend and, uh, and they um they concentrate on grabbing new technology and making sure that it fits properly into our environment. This could be culture. This is how do we go ahead and deploy this in our businesses and how do we feed it back? 
And then, of course, our mathematicians and our engineers, they're involved in the process of making our technology. Um, to say that STEM folks are science folks is fine. I'm not offended by it. I don't think it's inaccurate to say, oh, you're a STEM major. You must study science. Um, yes, that's true. If you're an engineering major at a college, you're going to take classes that are specifically entitled science. Um, the traditional sciences, um, the, the historical sciences, the physical sciences, physics, chemistry, biology. Um, then you're also going to take mathematics. And oh, by the way, the scientists take mathematics. Again, everybody studies this entire four, four term process. So to call, um, to call practitioners of this process scientists, I don't think anybody would be upset. To call the practitioners of this process technologists, fine, thank you, I'll take it. Engineers, oh, you're an engineer. I'll take it. Um, oh, you're a mathematician. Fantastic. However, um, individual humans, depending on their talents and their capabilities, typically um, uh, specialize in one of the four. And if not one of the four, if they specialize in all of the four to a degree, then they become systems specialists. They know enough of each of the parts in order to put together an entire system and, and be a cheerleader for that. So fantastic. Okay, we got that, got that down as, a, as an explanation. Inside this USDA education that I'm involved in as a, here I go, I'm dropping terms, as a scientist um, at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore, um, specifically in the chemistry department, um, I'm charged with introducing our students to another system, um, measurement systems. How do we go into the laboratory and measure things? Well, what do you want to measure? Well, what do you want to measure? Um, do you want to measure how much caffeine is in my coffee? Do you want to measure the temperature of my coffee? Do you want to measure how hard my coffee cup is? Um, do you want to measure how smooth it is? Do you want to measure from what height can I drop it and hit, hit, hit a hard surface before it cracks? All of those things are measurements. And again, as a scientist, I sort of fall on the science side. I have a heck of a respect for my colleagues who are technologists, engineers, and mathematicians because like everybody else, I realize for us to play ball as a team, we need people to play, sorry for the analogy, all the different positions and play them well and play them as a team. So yeah, um, this is me describing what we do, um, but I might, I might uh, play a different position as far as being a being more of a specialist in their area. But I'm gonna try my best to describe this again as an entry level um, area for our students uh, and for here, the audience. So, oh my gosh, there it is again, um, environment. <laughs> I think I went through my slides and made sure that environment was the first term. We're always considering the environment. I'll let that lay. The thing that we wish to make measure um, in, in my parlance and my vocabulary, we're simply gonna call that the data. There's no flame wars. Um, Wikipedia doesn't have to be accurate all the time. If you go to Wikipedia, it says the pronunciation of this four letter word, data or data, both are acceptable. And yeah, it depends on how late it is and, and um, how hard you've been working. If you wanna have a lovely heated discussion with a colleague, whether it's data or data, or whether it's plural or singular, or I fall into the data camp. So data is data, just like fish is fish. I'll look at the fish. I'll look at all the fish. It's, it's plural. Fantastic. Data is what we want to know. Again, I meant, let's just say, for instance, I want to know the temperature of my coffee. It's actually kind of, kind of chilled right now, but the temperature is inside my coffee. So that's why I put the temperature inside yet another box. Coffee is its own system. It's its own box. Yes, there's water and yes, I brewed it and yes, I put in heat. Fantastic. This is my coffee. And inside this coffee, there is a value of temperature that we'd like to know. So this is the measurement system of how we go about doing that. I'm grabbing my button here. What I wanna do is I wish to get that value out of the coffee. And that value, while it is still flying through the ether, flying through the air, is information. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, our boxes have the ability, they have little porous channels inside of them or openings or terminals. They can permit the flow of energy, 
material or information. Fantastic. So I'm going to allow this data, this value of the temperature to flow out of this box as information. Now, what actually flows out may not be the value of this kind of chill, chilly right now, 72 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, but white, what might flow out is some sort of response, a feeling, if I stick my finger inside of it, um, a feeling or a taste if I go ahead and, and drink some more. Maybe I stick a thermometer inside there. Now that I just picked up my red grading pan. If I stick my red alcohol thermometer in there, I might actually see this thing rise. Um, the alcohol rising in my thermometer is information. Oh, look, it went up. It must be hotter than the room temperature, or at least the temperature of this guy. It doesn't specifically tell me exactly the number I want yet. It just it just had a response. So that's information. Then we, like I just mentioned before, we have to take that um that value, that response, and we need to know about it, which is why we have a measurement system. Somebody needs to know. This is the publisher parish. If you spend millions of dollars in the laboratory and you do this once in a lifetime experiment and you write everything down and then you close the notebook and you stick it in a filing cabinet, do we still have those? You put it on a hard drive and then you bundle the hard drive and you throw it in the deepest of oceans and no one sees it ever again. Did you really get do anything with it? Knowing the data um, is important. So we have to make sure that this information is disseminated. Again, it's told to other folks. And yes, I'm not going to draw an extra arrow here, but there's an output from this system that goes into the environment. And the environment is here on the internet, here on YouTube, in scientific literature, your colleagues, other folks. Um, fantastic. But for now, data is what we want to measure. The information is what we get when we convince the information. I said it again, I'm defining it circularly, I apologize. The information is what we get when we convince the data to come outside. And then when we take the data that has been transformed in the information, we go ahead and transform it into knowledge. What does that actually mean? The fact that the alcohol in my alcohol thermometer rose does that mean it's hotter? Does that mean that it's chillier? I don't know. So we need some helper tools to do this. And the helper tools happen to be a transducer. I couldn't help but reach my pen and pretend it's a thermometer. The thermometer is the transducer. Again, trans meaning across. It's going to allow the data to cross this barrier of the box and start flowing and become information. In fact, um, Wikipedia even gets this right. Information is the flow of data uh, or the flow of facts or the flow of what you want to measure, which is kind of cool. In addition to having a transducer that helps us to convert the data that's stuck inside my coffee and then have it flow outside using a transducer, we also need a similar red boxed tool on this side um, that allows us to turn the information into knowledge. So I push a button over here. Sorry, I keep on pulling up my taskbar. Um, that's a model. We're going to use a model. What do you mean a model? Just like a model train, um, or a small model train, or a scale model train, like an HO scale um, train, is a much smaller version of something that's very, very large and allows us to look at that small version and learn from it without actually having the thing there. So rather than having the actual data in front of us, actually giving somebody the coffee and say, hey, measure it yourself, um, we can use a thermometer, not my red pen, and we can get the fact that this alcohol has gone up, and then we can put it into a model. And all for a thermometer, the model is actually painted or written on the side of the, th of the thermometer. So what we do is we say, oh, when the red little line or the red alcohol expands to that line, that tells me that it's 72 degrees. It's a 72 degree coffee. Um, we use models for all measurement systems, and depending on what form that model takes, that allows us to convert this information that we just got from the system we want to measure and allows us to know it. It's how it goes through our eyes. It goes through our senses. It goes through our measurement systems, whether it's, can I do this, um, sight, <laughs> sound, um, which is hearing, we have taste, we have smell, 
and we have touch. So there's the five senses. Fantastic. Um, the model interfaces between the information from the data we're measuring and it interfaces into something that allows us to know what the heck is going on. So yeah, off we go. So that's our guy. In order to get this entire, I just used HO scale trains, in order to get this entire train together, what's going to convince the data to leave and whatever analogy you want to use, get pulled through the transducer, I reach in and I grab it and I pull it, or get pushed through the transducer. And it turns out in this particular um, um, uh, picture here, I am pushing the data, I'm pushing a copy of the data. Again, if I push information of the temperature of this coffee out of my coffee, I'm not losing it. It's, all, it's sort of like a copy of, of, the, um, of the data. It's, I'm sort of copying it. I'm not actually removing it. It's not like this guy has zero temperature or no temperature, the absence of temperature, the empty set of temperature when I'm done. I'm going to use energy to push a copy of this data with the help of the transducer. That copy is going to become information. That information can flow to wherever it needs to flow. Sometimes it flows to the uh, the barrel of my thermometer, and I can read it off of the, the lines. Sometimes it flows to the display on my device. So here's my cell phone. I'm measuring something. It, it'll, it'll send itself um, to the, the chip over here. Maybe we send it through Wi-Fi. Maybe we send it through an inter Ethernet cable. Maybe it goes in this satellite off of a Starlink um, um, antenna uh, floating around um, in space. We get it to the model, and then the model goes ahead and crunches it, if you will, or processes it. They're all systems, and then we know what's going on. So that's our. This is this is the process of making measurements um, in a STEM environment. I need to know this. You bring your measurement to a STEM professional. And they'll say, "This is what we're going to do for you. We're going to." Think about what the environment is. We're going to select the correct transducer. We're going to use the appropriate energy. We're going to make a copy of it, grab that information. We're going to send that information into a model. The model is going to process or crunch on it. And then we're going to know, and then good, we're good to go. We now have a device that measures what you need to measure. Um, hate to keep on bringing up COVID, but this was the process that went through when holy crap, we need rapid COVID tests that we can get an answer almost immediately, or at least not send it back to the lab. This is the process that the science, the STEM scientists, I'm saying scientists, the STEM professionals went through to create a portable, within a few minutes, um, uh, COVID test um, uh, for, us to, for us to use. And we continue doing that because the environment keeps changing and we keep having new needs for additional measurements. Let me push the button and move over here. So very briefly, again, just looking at the energy and transducer part of things. Um, our students, if you were in um, our, our, our particular uh, um, degree program, we would spend some time talking about the different transducers or sensors. So yeah, a device that converts data of, or a property of the a property of the system into a signal um, information. So I like to use the word information. If we're specifically talking about information that's coming out of the transducer, sometimes we'll use the phrase signal. Fantastic. Um, types of transducers, examples of transducers. Um, for sound, yes, our hearing, but mechanically, a microphone. A microphone is a sound transducer or a sound sensor. Here's that picture of the um, of the red alcohol thermometer. It's sort of lying on its side. Um, but yeah, that's what we're talking about when we measure temperature. Um, this is a little a little photoresistor. It's, it's what you'll find inside of a night light. If you have a have a night light in your bathroom or your bedroom for your kids and um, what it does is it um, of course when you turn out the lights it senses that the light is missing and then it turns on its own light the way it does that is uses this little light transducer or this light sensor called a photoresistor um force a little force sensor this is a little there's a little blue button on this guy over here on this little blue button depending on how hard you press it it will register how many pounds or how many um, newtons, depending on what system we're using, of force we're on there. Uh, for all of you who have grown up with the Nintendo Wii, the original Nintendo Wii, we had the Nintendo Wii balance board, 
the Nintendo Wii balance board had these types of four sensors in each of the four corners. You could stand in the middle of it and it would average the amount of force. Hello, how much do you weigh today, Bill? Um, or if you lean to one side, then different force sensors would can tell which way that you were leaning. We, of course, use force sensors all over the place. The Nintendo Wii balance board happens to be an example of that. Um, acceleration, this is a large accelerometer that measures acceleration. We all have accelerometers inside of our phones. Um, this allows us to um, change um, how we're um, displaying things, viewing things, or as we're as we're um, taking a picture, we can go from um, portrait to landscape. It, your phone knows whether it's in this position or whether it's this in this position using accelerometers. That's how it knows because it has a measurement system inside of it. And then I think our a little, little last last guy here, if I can get this guy to work. Oh my gosh, come back here, you. There you go. Sorry for the blip. blip. I'm sure I'll cut it out in post-production. So I, I blipped. I pushed the wrong button. I actually grabbed my taskbar. Sorry about that. And the last one here, I have a little touch sensor. So... This is very similar to the uh, little switch we have inside of our refrigerator to make sure that the refrigerator door is closed. And when we close the door, um, it turns out the light. Um, this particular touch sensor is, is probably in, uh, for a larger machine where something has to be closed, like a washing machine um, door or your car door uh, to make sure things are happening. Again, if you need, if we as humans need to sense it or measure it, then we're going to use this system. Okay. The types of energy, this is for folks who have just um, just got out of physics in high school. For my students um, who are usually, I'm usually talking to people as, as freshmen. Um, types of energy, kinetic energy is the energy of movement, the energy of motion. Um, if you just got out of physics in high school or physics in college, you may uh, recall that one of our, um, one of our um, equations to memorize is kinetic energy equals one half mv squared, the mass times the velocity squared. It turns out that we'll use kinetic energy. We'll literally take an extremely small molecule or a small little ion inside a, a vacuum chamber inside an instrument, and we'll literally accelerate it or throw it from one side to the other. We'll measure how fast it's moving, or we'll measure, because velocity is position versus time, we'll measure how long it takes to go from one side to the other, and that depends on how massive it is. So we'll be able to measure the mass of a molecule or an ion inside of our machine, and that turns out to be a technique called mass spectrometry. So yeah, there's a backstory for mass spectrometry. Um, we move on to potential energy, which is the, the position inside of a force field of some kind, an electric field, a magnetic field, or in this case, a gravitational field. Um, in the case of an electric field, um, again, if you've been close to, to, um, to, uh, to education or you do this every day, our potential energy is defined as V equals IR. Um, so we measure voltage, um, which is the potential, the electronic potential, electric potential. We measure current, we measure resistance, uh, and that allows us to measure things specifically. I'm a chemist by train. Uh, we would call that electrochemistry if we're measuring how molecules react to this energy. Um, also, there's gravity. This is the acceleration due to gravity. Everybody remember, I have it tattooed somewhere. 9.81 is the average um, um, uh, gravitational potential, uh, gravitational acceleration here on Earth. Uh, the force of gravity equals the mass times the, the gravity uh, acceleration. Again, we can use this to measure mass. This is how I can measure the mass of my coffee. I put it on a scale. That's how we measured using the Nintendo Wii balance board. The Nintendo Wii balance board had those force sensors. I put my coffee on the balance board. It goes ahead and it measures the force. It guesses or it knows or it's been told that the acceleration due to gravity where I have this placed is 9.81 meters per second or 32 feet per second, uh, per second, and then it can back out the mass again. So we use mass spectrometry, that term for very small things like molecules. And this mass is for me measuring us. And yeah, whether it's me, I'm a big guy, or whether it's an 18 wheeler on the highway, we have to go through the scales. This is how we do that. We use potential energy, gravitational potential energy to measure the mass of something or the force that it's putting down there. Heat energy, we can flow heat into or out of. Again, I talked about the temperature of my coffee. We can actually learn something about the coffee depending on how fast it cools down or how fast it heats up. 
We do that not only with coffee. I have my 3D printer here over my, my shoulder. It's using polylactic acid or PLA filament at the moment. I have to melt it at 200 degrees Celsius. Um, in order for me to know that that's the correct melting temperature, somebody somewhere had to measure um, this, particular, um, this particular material. So that's called thermal analysis. And then our final system, not final as in last, but the final on this list, is light energy throwing light at it what color is it um how much does it absorb how dark is it like weak tea or or um or dark tea um is it light toast or it, is it dark toast all of those things light wise we can make a measurement and that's historically has been called spectroscopy so again each of these things has a prequel each of these things has an encycl encyclopedia entry each of these types of energies has scientists and engineers and mathematics and technology folks, uh, all STEM folks, um, developing new tools and discovering new things on how to use these energies. When we find new energies, we can cycle back around and we can use it to make new STEM things. In addition to those energies, we also have a related process where sometimes if I want to measure the temperature of my coffee, I'm good. I have to stick my thermometer, this is a pen, into my coffee to measure it. The coffee is right there, I know where it's at. Sometimes what we wish to measure happens to be hidden among other things. Like, again, I'll go back to this COVID thing again. We'd like to go ahead and um, measure to see if there's any COVID antibodies inside um, your spit. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get your spit, and we're going to separate it on a little tiny platform. It's going to take separation techniques it turns out that we do a lot uh we're worried a lot about separating um different components if you've done some separation before if you've done some thin layer chromatography or or um paper chromatography again i just just um um spoiler alert um this is often this particular technique is called chromatography uh, graphy meaning writing and chroma meaning color. Um, this is this is how chromatography and pretty much separation techniques themselves were discovered. Was back in the day um, when we took um, we took uh, crushed fall leaves. Um, Mikhail Svet, a Russian scientist, took crushed fall leaves and wanted, wanted to know why some leaves during the fall were red, some were yellow, some were brown, some were whatever. Why why do we have beautiful fall colors? Um, he crushed them all up, he dissolved them in a, a in solution, and then he performed this technique, and he saw how the individual colors actually separated um, on this little tiny piece of sheet. We have more advanced technologies for separating things. This is separating colored molecules. We, of course, if you go to the Coinstar, um, so thanks for the reference, you go to the Coinstar machine at your local supermarket, you take a whole um, whole jar of, of U.S. coins that you've been, uh, you've been collecting, it will separate them into only pennies and only nickels and only dimes and only paper clips and only nickels, um, and that's a separation technique as well. Um, we have lots and lots of technology to separate things. So it turns out that chromatography or separation techniques is just as important to our measurement system as the what flavor of energy we're going to use. So all of these things together, in order to analyze or measure something, the mass spectrometry, which was the kinetic energy, the electrochemistry, which was the potential energy, either well, in this case it was potential energy. We could also put inside there um, uh, gravitational to measure mass. Thermal analysis, spectroscopy, the light, and the chromatography. One, two, three, four, five. These are the five typical areas that are considered the purview of analytical chemistry. So if you happen to um, uh, watch my introduction, I mentioned that uh, my PhD is in analytical chemistry. I'm sorry I'm biased this way, but this is where my story comes from. Um, going to a graduate program and taking individual courses of study in each of these different um, areas and then putting them all together and calling yourself an analytical chemist, which again is, um, is charged with making measurements of, hey, this tastes funny, what's in it? Um, we have to go through some sort of analytical process to figure out what that is as a STEM professional. Our model on the other side, um, that was all that was all talking about transducers. 
What does the model look like? Well, the model typically involves, as I have here, involves information processing. Gosh, I know I just used the words I've already used. Processes inside the box. There's processing inside this model. This is sort of a red box, if you will. Um, we're going to take what we know information-wise. We might take other things that we know, mathematics, equations, constants, previous knowledge. We're going to hodgepodge that together in a process and out the other side. Ah, aha! Um, all these measurements mean it's going to rain in 10 minutes or uh, worse than that. Um, we're going to have a tornado condition in 10 minutes, depending on what you're measuring. And that's what our model is there for. And we do a lot of forecasting as well. Um, often, um, especially for folks who are entering this discipline or being familiarized with this discipline, is this um, this process inside the um, the model is often a computer program. It's often a piece of software. We have lots of experts who are modeling experts. Maybe they're modeling experts as in, especially with AI these days, maybe they're modeling experts in making a particular image. They want to model an image or they want to model a video or they're working on a, a new game engine or maybe, again, maybe they're working for a gaming company. They want to make the latest Fortnite or Assassin's Creed whatever the hip kids are playing these days. Um, that is a model of what the real world looks like. We're putting it inside here and then we're processing what's going on inside there. So that's the computer computer program. So our students, our professionals, someone who is engaged in STEM and making measurements, we need to also be engaged in modeling. And modeling often involves knowing how to code, learn to code. Um, so that's why software is so uh, so important. So along with the software, um, we have the hardware. I went ahead and pushed the button here. Um, the transducer with all of its individual energy handling um, and the light and the temperature typically involves um, physical things. And typically the way we solve a lot of things um, here these days is by using electronics. So we have a lot of wires running around. We have a lot of processes running around and that's typically known as the hardware part of the solution. And the hardware often, not always, but often um, is majorly or, or major wise, it represents the transducer. We then grab the response, grab the signal, grab the information from our transducer that gets plugged into our software and somebody needs to write the software. So hardware and software is what goes into making this measurement system. I need to find a better way to advance my slides. Um, so yeah, hardware, I mentioned before I dropped, I dropped some names. Um, in our laboratory here at the university, um, typically, uh, we could go with just naked wires and components, but typically um, we're going to use some sort of interface and why not use the interface that's available to everybody. We can go onto Amazon and buy one of these things. And that's typically um, an Arduino family of microcontrollers. They happen to be the hot dot. They happen to be not very expensive. If we're measuring something professionally, we're probably going to use a professional grade microcontroller or professional grade um, electronic system. And of course, it's going to cost as it's going to cost as much as a professional grade because it's professional grade. Uh, this is hobby grade, but um, yeah, for under under thirty dollars, you can get one of these um, one of these Arduinos and 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 run away. Um, the enclosure, the box. Um, Typically, whenever we make our circuits, our electronic circuits with all the transducers hanging out and the wires and back and forth, typically we need to put it into, I'm a systems guy, put it into its own little box. Now, the own little box will need input and it will need output, but we need a physical box. My coffee cup is my physical box container for my coffee right now. And it turns out it is convenient uh, now to use 3D printing, which is why I have my 3D printer here, is that after we design what we're going to design electronics wise, the hardware, it just makes sense to either not, you know, just lay it out there on the table, but it helps to protect it or, or mount different things. Um, typically what we're going to do is we're going to ask our students to um, get good at 3D design and then 3D printing. So this, I just grabbed this from the web. Someone has placed a little integrated circuit inside here. Um, in fact, this looks like another microcontroller. I think I see some video monitors over here, a full USB, and it's like a memory card. This might even be 
um, some sort of Raspberry Pi. Fantastic. And then this is a 3D printed box that it fits into just to keep it safe and keep it away from other things while we're making measurements in the laboratory. So the 3D, the 3D design and the 3D printing is also a skill that is useful for our STEM professionals and our STEM students and our STEM folks. And then we have software. Um, lots and lots of flame wars over what is the best software to use. Um, if we're in the uh, the Arduino space, we're probably talking about C, C++. If you know, you know. If we're talking about uh, Raspberry Pi, we're probably talking about Python. Um, it turns out that we're talking about what computer programming language are we using to make a computer program. And it just so happens that in our laboratory, um, we use LabVIEW. Um, so LabVIEW may be very, very popular. It may be very, very well known among STEM professionals. Uh, we keep on taking all these flame more, um, these flamey um, um, surveys to see who's the most popular. And typically, depending on if you ask the, the STEM folks, LabVIEW usually shows up pretty high. If you just ask general programmers who aren't doing STEMI type stuff, uh, usually uh, Python shows up or C, C++. Um, for those of you who are new to LabVIEW or returning, um, make sure if you're returning, make sure I got this right. Uh, LabVIEW is an acronym. Um, I've been working with LabVIEW pretty much since its inception in, in the mid 1980s. Um, there has been lots of um, debate over whether we should, who's we, whether the community should fight for a changed name, but it has stuck. And again, it just happens to stand for Laboratory Virtual Instrument Engineering Workbench. So a workbench is it's sort of like my office here. A workbench is where we tinker with things. So it's an engineering workbench to build instruments. But instead of building real instruments, it's for building real but virtual instruments. And it's for the laboratory. So that's where this lab view comes through. It's a unique name. I don't think there's many other um, uh, 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 products that are close to sounding like LabVIEW. So I'm, I'm from the um, the group that says, yeah, let's just keep it LabVIEW and, and make some educational changes as far as what it is. So if you are a laboratory professional, if you are a STEM professional, you recognize this particular instrument as being an instrument. This instrument is a box. Sorry, I'm a systems guy. All I see are boxes. It's a box. This box has input. The inputs take the form of buttons and knobs and sometimes switches. There's a button down there. Um, this is a screen. I don't think it's a touch screen. So I think these buttons can, anyway, if it's a touch screen, wonderful. All of these things over here are controls. They're things that allow us to take input from the user, the, the engineer, the technician, whoever's on the outside saying, hey, turn the volume up or turn the volume down. These are, on, these are outside the box. After adjusting the volume knob, something inside the box um, processes that information and then gives you output. And in this particular instrument, um, this is a mixed signal oscilloscope from Keysight. Um, its display, the output looks like this, this, um, this lovely color, well, display, this color screen. So all the inputs seem to be sort of stuck over here. There's places to plug in some, uh, some um, connectors and some memory cards and a USB. There's lights over here. That's output telling whether things are on or off. I'm sure they, they're multicolored. There's yellows, there's greens, there's blues, there's reds. And then this is the output. This is typically what a physical laboratory instrument looks like. It has a box. It has a container. Um, maybe it's metal. Maybe it was 3D printed using a metal 3D printing machine. It, it, I, I don't believe it, this particular instrument is a commercial instrument. We wouldn't use our 3D printer over here. But it has inputs, it has outputs, and the process is inside. And it depends on the environment, and the environment is in the name. This is a laboratory instrument. We're going to use this in a laboratory. Yes, I can throw it in the back of our pickup truck and take it into the middle of the cornfield and do some analysis. And don't worry, I brought this machine along. That's fine. But typically, I'm going to go out into the cornfield. I'm going to collect some samples. And I'm going to drive it in the pickup truck back to the laboratory. So again, it depends on where it's at. Um, so yeah, um, LabVIEW, I mentioned before, it is an engineering workbench that is used to make laboratory instruments 
but there's a V in there making, making it virtual. So it turns out that LabVIEW virtual instruments, they're called VIs, um, yes, they have to live somewhere because they're virtual, just like uh, Fortnite needs to live somewhere. Um, Assassin's Creed needs to live Sorry, I'm grabbing it. Assassin's Creed needs to live somewhere. Um, some box somewhere is processing the virtual version and then it's displayed on the screen. So I have a picture here. It's a lovely image from the, from the net over here. I'll take a look at this guy. Um, they, they each, each of these um, technicians, or I don't want to dig, some people take offense to being an engineer and call technicians. These STEM folks who are working and doing a great job. Um, this happens to be a picture from um, our photograph from inside SpaceX. And it looks like they're doing some testing. Uh, it looks like a Dragon capsule. Again, SpaceX has resupply capsules and it has astronaut capsules. Pretty impressive. All of these front panels here, again, they have buttons and they have screens and displays. These are all panels from LabVIEW. It turns out, again, how popular is is LabVIEW, it turns out that it is the um, instrument integration software that is used by SpaceX. Now, I, I, haven't, I haven't interviewed the SpaceX folks. Maybe they use it also at Tesla. I'm not really sure. Maybe just an Elon Musk thing. But somebody somewhere said, hey, this LabVIEW happens to be the correct or an awesome or enough people know it that we should use this tool to accomplish our our, our um, goal of making measurements in our laboratory. Um, in this case, it's a, it's a testing laboratory. Maybe the testing laboratory is over here with all these blue things over here, but they're actually looking at it and looking at the data they're getting from it and monitoring it from these screens. So they are operating a virtual instrument and the virtual instrument lives inside these general, they might be very expensive, but these are general purpose computers and displays. So much like a really advanced video game lives inside an advanced expensive computer, the computer itself was not built specifically to play that video game, but it is a gaming computer. These computers were not built specifically to actually monitor scientific measurements in a laboratory, but that's what they're being used for. And that's how LabVIEW is used for that. LabVIEW, um, I'm a big proponent. I've used it for a few decades. Uh, plan on having a lot of backstory, a lot of prequels, a lot of uh, tutorials on introducing LabVIEW and using it. But again, this is just how do these things go together and uh, and and produce our instruments. So again, here's our here's our little overview. There's our measurement system um, for developing new instruments. We have the energy that is required to push the data through our transducer, converting it into information that it is accepted by the model that processes it and tells us what answer we knew about in a particular environment. It turns out this box requires its own input and it produces its own output. The output is the knowledge of the environment. But what inputs do we need? And this is what we're talking about as we're educating our new STEM professionals. We need electronics. We need um, those circuits that will make this work. So this is this is sort of talking about the ingredients that go into making a new measurement system or instrument development. We need electronics. We need 3D printing, the material, um, or um, and 3D printing and 3D design. 3D printing is a broad term. It doesn't necessarily mean plastic. Um, it can mean all kinds of things, and more increasingly, it can mean metal. Um, some of the parts at SpaceX are now being 3D printed, and their rockets are launching using 3D printed components in their engines. So it's not just for um, just for hobbyists and playing around inside class. And then we need this controlling software for the model. So this is the system. That, um, that we put together here at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore to get our STEM-based students familiar with making measurements in the laboratory and familiarizing themselves with electronics, at least the basics of electronics and perhaps even the Arduino, um, 3D design and printing, and then lab view. So these are the three things. What can you do with all these things? Well, again, it depends on the environment. Getting back to my insistence that environment is important after all of these individual little things. Um, 
So what about the environment? Well, again, we've been talking about the research laboratory. So yeah, this, this I just went to the web and I grabbed a picture of a research laboratory. I typed into Google research laboratory. I think this is what we would expect to get if someone were to say, hey, here's a picture of a research laboratory. It looks like, well, first of all, it looks like it's clean. It looks like it's well controlled. Um, the temperature is controlled. It's like a lot of a lot of places where we can do repeatable measurements where things are quiet they're not vibrationally crazy um again looks a lot different than a cornfield uh cornfield's fantastic it's where the corn actually lives but maybe we need to bring the corn back to the lab to work on it it also happens to have on the benches a whole bunch of measurement instruments which is why we stress understanding how measurement instruments are designed how they're built maybe even build a few of them so that you understand more deeply so that when through your career um, you use these instruments, you get a better appreciation of how they work. So this goes to for everybody, right? So if you happen to be a car enthusiast and you love to drive racing cars, maybe um, you find yourself um, actually rebuilding a car or actually designing your own engine. The more you know about what goes into the device, the more sub components of the system, sorry for the vernacular, uh, the more the, the more you can appreciate where you're working with. So this really does look like a, a pretty well outfitted research laboratory. What about a wind tunnel? Another, this is a different environment. Um, so this is um, Arnold Engineering uh, Center, uh, part of the Air Force. It turns out this is not one of my photographs, but this is a photograph of a what looks to be a model plane, like an HO train. A model plane looks to be a drone. I don't see any people. Maybe it's not a drone. I'm not really sure. Um, it happens to be on the end of this rod back here called the sting. There's a bunch of wires that are connecting to it. That's how the information flows back. And this particular model happens to be painted pink, a lovely color, of, a lovely shade of pink. Um, this lovely shade happens to be, this technique happens to be a sensor. The sensor is called pressure sensitive paint. And um, the reason why I bring it up and the reason why I talk about it all the time is myself, along with my other STEM colleagues back in the 1990s, um, we actually worked on bringing this type of sensor out of where it was discovered at universities into the actual engineering laboratory to use it. And we spent a lot of time at Arnold um, um, testing it. This is a more, this is a latest or later version. We just didn't have the cell phones back in the day to take a lot of pictures. I don't have many pictures. The pictures that we did use back in the day were pictures of the paint itself. You'll notice there's a camera up here in this little window down here. And these digital cameras, um, my five megapixel camera is the front facing camera on my not very new Samsung Galaxy S21. This front facing um, pix camera, um, back in the day when we were working through the 90s, we had one of those. Um, first of all, it wasn't color, it was black and white, um, but also they were $25,000. So um, the cost has come down technology wise. This is a more modern version of, um, of the wind tunnel. Uh, and making the the environments a wind tunnel, and again, depending on what you want to simulate, you can simulate slow slow wind, high wind. Um, you could turn this into water and turn it into um, to finding things that are swimming underwater. Whatever you'd like to do. Um, just some more examples to bring this um, this discussion hopefully to a close. Uh, how about biomedical research? Yes, we could actually work inside the human body, but for now, um, mostly we're going to take cells. This is me pretending to have a hypodermic needle. We take cells out of us and we study them. Maybe we study them under a microscope. Uh, maybe we put it into a very large machine like there, like there is back here in the back. And um, we go ahead and we, again, look at the knowledge that we get running through our models um, on these screens. So there's a whole bunch of cells that are perhaps being recorded by this microscope over here. So again, the biomedical research is another type of laboratory, sort of a different environment. Um, how about a manufacturing plant? Um, so I just happened to put in manufacturing plant. It turned out to be an assembly line for automobiles. Lots of people, uh, good paying jobs, lots of machines that they are producing, a lot of technology they're, machine, they're producing. Automobiles these days um, just happen to be pretty much uh, robots on wheels, uh, whether they are 
whether they are uh, internal combustion engines or whether they're electric vehicles, they're just robots on wheels. They've got so much electronics and so much um, um, sensors looking around and keeping you safe and keeping them safe, quite honestly. The manufacturing plant itself has a lot of robots. It has a lot of machines. It has a lot of measurement techniques. Looking at some buttons down here, it's like a bunch of values over here, a couple computers running around. So again, um, as a young person who is entering our program, um, this might be their future employer working for a large manufacturing plant that needs um, people who understand how we make measurements um, from a STEM background. If not a manufacturing plant, I mentioned about filling that wind tunnel with water. How about underwater? Um, this just happens to be a hot topic in the news as I record this in, in August of uh, 2024. This is the Manta Ray, um, sort of a stealth underwater uh, remote uh, unmanned um, autonomous vehicle. Um, it is purported to have all kinds of um, sensors and all kinds of spy um, spy abilities. Um, even if all of those aren't true, I'm certain they are. Even if it just measures the temperature or gives us warning about an, a, a, a tsunami coming or measuring all kinds of things, well, depending on what, the fact that we are learning more things about the ocean, which of course is our environment, environmental science being ocean, is important. Um, placing this sensor platform, it looks like it looks like a manta ray, it looks like it has wings. But for me, all I see is a, a bunch of sensors, a bunch of instruments that are included in this sensor platform that um, autonomously um, or remotely controlled swims around and then gives us information about where we live. This will permit us or it will allow us to actually colonize um, the bottom of the ocean. This is where Atlantis comes from. So if, if, if Atlantis used to be a historical rumor or a historical fable, we need to make an Atlantis a future fable or science future. Um, why would that be the case? Uh, one, it'd be great if we had some extra area, square surface area on the earth uh, to develop into places for humans to work, live, and vacation. Uh, this happens to be that this surface, the bottom of the ocean, happens to be covered with water rather than being, in addition to being covered by air. Also, as we vacation and as we work and as we manufacture and process things under the water, um, and again, there may be advantages for all of those things, it also gives us experience working and living and existing as humans outside of our normal environment of just walking around. Um, so when things break, um, we can fix them. If we have an emergency, we can get folks help. But if it, things turn completely catastrophic, like, oh my gosh, we have to abandon ship, um, we can come back to the surface and everybody's happy. Um, future, future, as we start going to bigger space stations, as we start going to space stations on the moon and we eventually get to Mars, if things go catastrophically sideways, um, I, we don't have the technology at the moment to have an immediate lifeboat send us back. So it, it makes sense for us to solve some of these issues that we're going to find living remotely underwater before we start moving into outer space. So this is, this is a, I'm happy to see this. I'm happy to see that this was revealed. I'm happy to see they're start talking about it. I hope that it gets, um, fellow interested STEM professionals or STEM students excited about um, starting a STEM career and start start um, researching these different areas. And then my final thing here, as I just mentioned, going to Mars, I knew this was coming up, so that's why Mars was in my head. Um, what if the environment is not the laboratory? What if it's not in a field somewhere? What if the environment is not inside of our body? Um, what if it's not in a wind tunnel? What if it's not underwater? What if it's on the surface of Mars? So we have the Perseverance Mars rover. We sent it up a few years ago. Um, it is, again, a platform filled with measurement devices. So we send up the rover, one, to see if we can do it. Can we get there? Can we get it to run around? Those are lovely things to learn. But while we're there, we'd like to learn more things. We'd like to measure things and send that, beam that knowledge back. So lots of cameras, lots of instruments. There's a spectrometer, fantastic. There's an ultraviolet spectrometer, a weather station, imagers. Um, this is an experiment to see if they can produce oxygen from the embedded oxygen in the rocks. Uh, surface radar, subsurface radar. 
all kinds of um, transducers to get us to um, learn more about this remote planet Mars in preparation of, if it's next Friday, I'm kind of surprised, hooray, we're going to Mars. It might be a few years from now, um, depends on, it's very difficult to predict how far into the future science fiction turns into science uh, fact or science uh, future. Um, I don't know why I have my hand here, but typically we think about it being linear, but often it becomes exponential where we make a single discovery and off it goes. So again, um, my little introduction here, I know it wasn't little. Uh, thanks for sticking with me if you're able to stick with me or actually watch it in parts. Um, overview wise, um, I am a STEM professional. I claim to be a STEM professional. Uh, if you go to my LinkedIn page, I think it says STEM educator or STEM professional. Um, I do not have a degree that says STEM in it. Um, I have a degree that says chemistry. I have a degree that says physics. I have a degree that says analytical chemistry. Um, I've had some mathematics along the way. I, I employed myself and, and my wife and I had our first two kids and we bought, bought our house through the 1990s. I was a programmer, a software programmer. So it just turns out that by experience, I've, I, I have found myself working um, as the S in the S position, in the T position, in the E position, and the M position of being a STEM professional. So again, a STEM professional is a, is a sort of a, a jack of all trades um, where we can see this entire process. Um, they're not a master of none. They're a jack of all trades. They may have some mastery at different levels in each of these four things, but what they are masters of is there's ma they're masters of understanding how this entire process goes together. Um, this sounds a lot like a conclusion, so I'll make that go away. Um, again, thanks for sticking with me. I hope you appreciate this. Uh, if you do, um, do what you normally do for a YouTube. Give me a thumbs up and let me know that um, this is useful. Uh, I love your comments. Um, comments can be um, hooray. Um, comments can be criticism, never coming back. Um, whatever you'd like. If you ask a question, I will try to respond and we'll see how that works. So um, I hope I pressed all the buttons correctly. I'll soon, soon find out when I, when I press this stop recording if this worked. And uh, I hope to see you again soon. Thanks for your time. Appreciate it.